Okay, so we're going to start on the brain, the brain lecture. Let me do the share screen. So what we're going to cover today is going to be part one, part two. So for ventricles and meninges, we want to know the location and function of each of the cranial meninges, as well as the cerebral spinal fluid. Where does it come from and where does it go? So as you can recall, when we did the spinal cord, the meninges are the three layers. We have the outer layer, the dura mater, which is the tough outer layer, um, arachnoid, fibrous, spider web-like. You can see the arachnoid down here below in the gray. And so we can see all these little projections. That provides a space so that our cerebral spinal fluid can travel within that space. And then the pia is actually on the surface. Let me change this here is going to be on the surface of the brain itself. And so it's sort of a protective layer that way. We can see the same layers over here, whether we have the pia that's a directly attaching the spinal cord, or we have this um, arachnoid layer here, or we have the dura out this. This is a lot nicer picture showing the surface of the brain with the PM matter on it, as well as the arachnoid with the spaces where the cerebral spinal fluid can go through. So cerebral spinal fluid goes through this subarachnoid space. And then we can see the dura. It's actually made of two layers because some areas, um, the two layers are going to be important. But right now in this diagram, you can just see the one very thick layer and then the bony structure of the dura. This is what a brain would look like if you were to just cut the skull off and look at somebody's head. You would see just the brain. You will see that this is just the dura mater. So this is one of the brains that we have in our laboratory. Um, this is the dura mater's pulled back. And what you can see here, this film that's on the surface of the brain is the arachnoid mater. And then you don't really notice the pia because it's just on the surface of the brain. So the spaces, meaning intermeningeal spaces, the most important one to be aware of is this subarachnoid space that is underneath the arachnoid mater, which is filled with cerebral spinal fluid. The ventricles are spaces within the brain. We have two lateral ventricles, one on the, either side, right and left. It's divided by the septum pellucidum, which you don't see in this um, diagram. The third ventricle comes down and it would be sort of this area here. That's the third ventricle. And then it connects down to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct is sort of this kind of neck region kind of thing here. And then the fourth ventricle down here is this lower portion right there that's kind of enlarged. These are all distinct spaces within the brain and each within each of those spaces we will actually make cerebral spinal fluid. This is a diagram here where we can see the lateral ventricles, the third ventricle, and the fourth ventricle. The connection between the third and the fourth is known as the cerebral aqueduct. We can see here is a lateral ventricle and here's another lateral ventricle and the third ventricle is actually right there. This brain's kind of collapse and mush together so the third ventricle is a little more squished um, than it other normally would be. So what is cerebral spinal fluid? Cerebral spinal fluid really cushions um, and uh, provides a space, provides buoyancy for the brain. The brain is made of fat, so fat floats. So you, the brain is actually within the skull, but floating in this cerebral spinal fluid. It helps to also bring um, nutrients and certain chemicals to the brain. We make cerebral spinal fluid where we keep a lot of stuff out, um, but it's helping to flush the brain, provide it with nutrients. It's sort of the brain's version of blood, but it's different than blood because it actually doesn't have blood cells in it. So cerebral spinal fluid is made by the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus are these little granular structures that are within each of the ventricles. And it makes cerebral spinal fluid. We're looking at about 500 milliliters per day. 
and it will be produced here within the ventricles of the brain. It then goes down the central canal of the spinal cord, out by the cauda equina, and then now back around the outside to be picked up on this top part of the brain by features known as arachnoid villi. They're going to reabsorb the cerebral spinal fluid. You can see a what, kind of enlarged view here of some of the arachnoid villi. And here is the cartoon version of the choroid plexus that's going to make the cerebral spinal fluid. This is an image that shows the cerebral spinal, spinal fluid does look like some gross fungus that's actually growing inside the brain. If we cut open a brain, you'll see this kind of stringy granulated tissue that just doesn't look right. It looks like some sort of infection and actually those that's the choroid plexus within and what they do is seep out this cerebral spinal fluid. Then the arachnoid villi located here is actually returning that cerebral spinal fluid back to the blood. So as we said before, the cerebral spinal fluid will start being, or being made by the choroid plexus, so that's kind of within the brain itself, runs down the central canal of the spinal cord, so that's where we're here, gets out at the level of the cauda equina, and now it's going to come back up and around the outside of the spinal cord in the subarachnoid space, around the brain in the subarachnoid space, until it gets the many granulations at the top, which are known as arachnoid villi, to reabsorb it again. So you have to have a balance of one area making it and another area drawing it out. So it's constantly, you're not making too much at any given time or not enough. We know that the end of the spinal cord is about L1. So if someone's gonna do a spinal tap, they're usually between L3 and L4, so that at the needle as it goes in, will not directly harm the spinal cord, it's down where there's nerves and they get out of the way from the needle. So that's where you're gonna tap, um, do a spinal tap, you actually pull out cerebral spinal fluid. So even though you're doing it way down there in someone's lower back, you're able to sample fluid that came from inside the brain. So the blood brain barrier is a barrier between the capillaries and the space around the brain. And so it's this blood brain barrier that is preventing some of these large proteins, a lot of medications because they're large molecules, um, red blood cells, those kind of things are not crossing the blood brain barrier. We do allow crossing into the brain space, water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, glucose, this is gonna go through, as well as fat soluble substances, alcohol being one of them, which is why it can affect people's um, cognition, as well as anesthetics. And then we are put a little tighter regulation or control on things that are pH, certain ions. We wouldn't want like a flood of potassium coming through. We don't wanna stop action potentials from happening or repolarizing and, you know, so those things are regulated a little more tightly. We can see this other picture. This is more of the arachnoid villi here. The cerebral spinal fluid is within this sort of white space, spinal fluid, that's the CSF, and it comes out into these arachnoid villi. And what's in here is a dural sinus, and there is actually blood in here. So the cerebral spinal fluid is going to be returning back to the blood, and then it goes to the jugulars and goes back to the general circulation. These little guys here are actually, it looks like, again, it looks like a fungus growing on the top of the brain. That is the arachnoid villi. This here is the arachnoid mater, all of this here, that film. But then these are little clumps and clusters that are the arachnoid villi that's reabsorbing cerebral spinal fluid. So blood supply to the brain, we go into this in a lot more detail in 202, where we talk about the specific vessels. For your purpose, all you need to know is that there are four main arteries. We have two vertebral arteries coming up to serve the brain, as well as our two internal jugular, or, um, sorry, as our two internal carotid arteries, bringing blood up to the brain. And then when we bring blood back away from the brain, we're using our internal jugular veins.
In this picture, we can see the internal carotid right here, as well as you can see the vertebral going through the little holes along the vertebral column. We'll learn more about those specific holes when we get to the skeletal system in the next unit. This next part is more where I want you to understand how these ventricles of the brain are formed. We're going to talk about this in more detail when we get to the reproductive system in 202. However, because we're talking about the brain and these spaces and these sort of tunnels and channels throughout someone's brain, I still want you to have a sense of how it came to be. So there is this thing known as the neural tube. Um, when we are embryos, early embryos, like within the first two, like the second week, second to coming into third week, second and third weeks, we are like three stacked pancakes. The bottom stack rolls under to become a gut tube. Think of it like a paper towel tube. It's just like a tube. You have a mouth end and you have an anus end. Then we have the next layer that wraps around. That's going to turn into Oh, sorry. The mouth end to the anus end is really going to be our digestive tract. The next layer is going to be our muscles and our bones and a bunch of our other organs. And finally, the top layer that wraps around, so now we end up, now we're like this long tube, is going to be our brain and um, nerves. So in that top layer, what I'd like you to see is here we are as the pancake across here. Now, if you do a cross section, this is the top layer. And this is before it's turned into a tube. So I mentioned the mouth to anus, which is the inside. Um, this will start to rise. And this will start to rise. So you'll see these little ridges coming up. And ultimately, these ridges are going to come together. They're going to meet in the middle. And so they start to seal up. They're going to seal up here towards the middle. It starts in the middle of the back first and then extends out on either side, sort of like a ziplock. So it starts from here and you start to go this way as well as going that way. If you don't have enough folic acid, which helps to seal this, then it will remain open and you won't close it and you will end up with spina bifida. Spina bifida is when this does not close right here, then if the nerve tube doesn't close, then there's nothing for the bones to then grow around. There's no template for it to follow. And therefore, when the baby's finally formed, it won't have closed that portion of the spinal column or the vertebral column. And so the dura matter is actually going to bulge out on the back of this person and the cauda equina can actually stick out and be within that bubble. If it's severe enough, um, they, the nerves that's within there are not extending down to the legs and the person can be paralyzed. So folic acid is incredibly important, but I want you to notice more is this is on day 22. Conception will happen on day, anywhere from day 14 to 16, usually. Um, and it's, you have a 24 hour window for an egg to get fertilized. Then you have two weeks for that egg to get implanted and then the woman has her period. The week that a woman should be having her period, if she ends up pregnant, is the week this is happening. So a woman that's late with her period saying, oh, I must be stressed out or I'm just late. If she is indeed pregnant, the neural tube is formed. She may wait another week or so, get a pregnancy test or see your doctor, and then she'll be asked to take folic acid. Well, by then it's too late. You've either formed this or you didn't. So many of the foods that we eat are actually fortified by folic acid because to prevent this particular birth defect. Once the brain is formed and the tube is complete, you can see that we're kind of curved over. The front part of the brain enlarges and gets really bulbous. Then you can see here's another part of the brain gets kind of bulbous and then another part. So you can kind of see this long paper towel tube that's kind of arched around starting to puff up in different regions. So you can see this is the first part of the brain enlarging, actually folding back on itself. Notice that this tube is still a long tube. We just have it arched around, obviously like this, but inside of the tube is the central canal. 
So it has its own little hole inside of this tube. And ultimately, that's where the ventricles of the brain are going to be um, forming cerebral spinal fluid. So we can see the brain here, how we have, um, it started as just this sort of large bulbous end. And as it develops more, the wormy structure of the brain actually increases surface area so we can add a lot more neurons into a brain like this than we can into the smooth one over here. So eventually this, this smooth brain, we can see it over here obviously, is going to wrap around. And so all of this turquoise and this orange portion, that actually stays pretty consistent but you now have this purple cerebrum wrapping around it like a helmet as it develops. So you can see the different stages of development here at um, various ages. This is a six week old embryo. So you can see how it's fairly developed. This is six weeks after conception. So it would be a couple weeks after a missed period. This is actually spina bifida. I, um, you can see actually where the, there is no bony structure here, so the dura will actually stick out. And in some cases, you can see part of the nerves are actually going to protrude out within there. This is what it looks like here on a little baby. So what you need to know from this section is the meninges. The, you have the dura, arachnoid, and pia you know that cerebral spinal fluid flows through the subarachnoid space. Cerebral spinal fluid is made by the choroid plexus and it's reabsorbed by the arachnoid villi. You should know the pathway where it goes through the brain, down the central canal, and back up around through that subarachnoid space, the top of your brain, to get it reabsorbed by the arachnoid villi. You don't need to know the details of your embryological development of the brain. The cerebrum part, Okay, we're going to know these, these are all the parts that we're going to go through. So this one's a little bit longer. We're just going to do this outer portion of the brain. And then our next lecture, we'll talk about some of the inner components. So the main regions of the brain is the cerebrum. The cerebrum is all of this stuff that's the wormy structure. Now this brain is kind of like a see-through brain because the other parts, we have the diencephalon, that's going to be deep inside. So you normally wouldn't see it from this view, but it's just letting you see what's inside. That's the diencephalon. The brain stem is we have the mesencephalon and we have our pons and we have our medulla. That's sort of all of this here in this brain stem area together. And then we finally have the cerebellum, which is known as the little brain, it's sort of like this little tailgate brain on the back. This cerebrum is what our topic is for the rest of this lecture. So the neural cortex, also known as the cerebral cortex, has all of these folded wormy structures. The bumps are the gyri and the cracks between them are sulci. And the deep groove, front to back is known as a fissure. This one's the longitudinal fissure. So we can see our gyri and sulci going along here. The gray matter and white matter. We've already discussed the differences between gray matter and white matter in the spinal cord, but it also holds true for the brain. So white matter is going to be a bunch of axons. So if we're going to draw a, um, a neuron, We'll do, say, dendrites and cell body out here in the gray matter. The axon is coming across in the white matter to an axon terminal. Hmm. Trying to get a different color. I seem to be having trouble with that. And I'll do more red. And then this may synapse onto a second dendrite cell body that may go to another location of the brain, which may synapse onto another one. So I'll draw yet another one. And this one may go down the spinal cord. So you can see within this diagram, the white matter portion is going to be only where the axons are, where the gray matter is where we have an axon terminal and a cell body and dendrite, so it's actually where a synapse is going to take place. That's going to be in the gray matter. The white matter is just the wires themselves, but not the connections. 
I think that you already saw this. So we can see through here, let's see, we'll see this one. These are various tracks through the brain from an MRI or PET scan, I believe. So these are mazes where we can actually see the tracks of information as they come up or down the spinal cord, up to the thalamus, and then out to various parts of the cerebrum or the cerebrum bringing information down this way. On a cross section, we can see obviously the gray and white matter. Um, what's interesting about this is someone with Alzheimer's disease, you can see that there's a significantly shrunken brain and it's shrunken in a lot of these really important areas where the gray matter is no longer there. So it's actually more of a gray matter problem in many of these areas. The corpus callosum specifically is a part of the brain that connects from one side or another. So if we have say cell bodies, dendrites, and an axon seen across over here to this side. So what the corpus callosum is, is more of a right to left movement of axons. When we see a dissected brain here, people always assume that it goes forward and back, and that is wrong. So what happens, this picture here is actually, I'm gonna put several dots because this means the axons are coming out the screen towards you and we've just cut them. So if you were to get up really close to that particular corpus callosum on the right side, it would almost be like you cut the end of like shag carpet and so it would be kind of fringed there. And so this is more of a connection where the corpus callosum really is a connection from two sides of the brain and it's made of entirely white matter. So the cerebrum itself is divided into four main lobes. We'll need to know those four main lobes in a very, in a general sense, but we're going to then go further and expand our functional knowledge of the brain into more regions within these lobes. But let's just start with the basic lobes. Our frontal lobe is all of this pink and including the red portion. That's the frontal lobe. Then we have the parietal lobe that includes the purple and the lavender. That's this over here. The temporal lobe is now this sort of yellowish region. And the occipital lobe is the posterior part of the brain. The fissures, these are the cracks. We have the longitudinal fissure, which you don't see in this picture because it's the division between the right and left. The central sulcus is a really important feature that's right here between this red and purple band. This red band you can see is identified as the precentral gyrus. We're going to talk more about that. That is the part of the brain that is specifically hardwired to every single skeletal muscle of the body. So you stimulate a certain region along this red portion, that precentral gyrus, and you will move various body parts. When we talk about the postcentral gyrus, that actually is sensory. And so if you, it's receiving information from all over the brain. The lateral sulcus is this crack here on the side and parietal occipital sulcus is kind of back over here. There's not a lot of cracks be here between them, parietal occipital, but that one's, we don't really hardly ever identify that one. So the two main ones you really need to know, central sulcus and lateral sulcus, but the central sulcus is by far the most important one. In here, we can see the brain. The central sulcus is actually the only one that comes straight off of the longitudinal fissure. So you'll be able to, you would be able to identify it if you were to actually see it on a brain or a neurosurgeon would. So for instance, then this gyrus here would be the area that controls all the muscles of the body. The gyrus behind it would be the area that receives sensory information all over the body. So this just says the functional principles of the cerebrum, that first of all, motor control, our right side of the brain controls the left side of our body. Our left side of our brain controls the right side of our body. And then the second thing is the two hemispheres, they're not exactly the same. They have very similar structures, but they will do slightly different things. One example, which we're coming up to, we're gonna learn about Broca's area on the left, and it controls the muscles for speech. That same area on the right adds emotion to our speech. 
So I could say something like, I'm so happy. And I say it in an exuberant way. The words, I'm so happy is coming from Broca's, but the extra exuberance is coming from the right side that's adding that to the word. So there's similar functions, but at the same time, different. So that is also considered lateralization. So that each hemisphere can perform certain functions that may not be performed on the other side. So here are just some examples. This is a nice summary of the lobes of the brain that I already pointed out. This is a lot more detailed. The occipital lobe is primarily works on vision. The parietal lobe, the yellow area, is all sensory. Anything that's coming from the body is going to be directed up into this parietal lobe. So that's where we feel, taste, taste, and, understand, um, and comprehend in terms of that what we're feeling and discriminate what we're feeling. If you rub your hand on something rough, is it dirt? Is it you know gravel? Or is it just the bottom of your shoe? You're able to discern those kind of things. The frontal lobe has two big, um, two main things. The first one that we're gonna really focus on is motor control. That's controlling all the muscles of our body. And that's gonna be in this main area. But now the front part of the frontal lobe, this sort of kind of behind the forehead part, that's where we're really doing our higher order thinking. That's where it's our personality, our long-term goal setting, our restraint, our you know, impulse control, all kinds of things there. Temporal lobe here in green, it's easy to remember because it's right under the ear, so hearing is interpreted here, as well as smell. Smell is kind of tucked in on the inside, and we have a lot of memory components also within on the inside of that portion. Now we're gonna get into more of these functional um, regions. And we're gonna start with the central sulcus here and our premotor, our premotor cortex, sort of precentral gyrus, which will be our primary motor cortex, or our postcentral gyrus, which is our somatosensory cortex. So what we have again, the central sulcus. So this frontal lobe portion here, so the red band that we have identified as the precentral gyrus is still within the frontal lobe. It will be better off known as, and you should write this on the test, um, this is the primary motor cortex. This primary motor cortex that's right here identified in the red band is the part of the brain that controls each of our skeletal muscles. And it's a very precise body map here. So each region is hardwired to a different part of your body. Whereas this postcentral gyrus, meaning behind the central sulcus, is known as the primary somatosensory cortex. That means all of our sensory information, touch, um, temperature, pain, pressure, all of these things are coming up and they terminate there on this primary somatosensory cortex. This is, I believe, posted on Canvas, so you can print many more of these. I would recommend having several of these blank ones available so that you can fill them in yourself, use them to quiz yourself, because you will be seeing this specific um, diagram, and you will have to fill it out and identify them on your practical exam. So we're going to go through these regions piece by piece. Here's a list of what you'll do. I'm just gonna move forward here so we could see it. The primary motor cortex, which is this part. Let me just do it a different color. So we have our primary motor cortex. As I said, that's the region that's hardwired. If you were to stimulate a little part here, your arm might move. If you stimulate another part, maybe your leg moves. So it's really the puppet master of your body. But what controls this? What controls this is the premotor cortex. The premotor cortex is the planner. It's the one, it's the area of the brain that you are teaching when you learn to do a skill. So if you're learning to ride a bike or learning to walk, 
you could use all the muscles. You already have the primary motor cortex that will actually move your legs in a pattern. It can move forward, but in order to do it in the appropriate sequence so that you contract one muscle but relax another, whether you're riding a bike and you're balancing, you need to you know, contract your upper body muscles for balance as well as your leg muscles to pump. All of that training when you're practicing to ride your bike you're putting that into the premotor cortex. So it knows the proper order of which muscles to recruit and the proper sequence in the primary motor cortex. So training and practice of any skill is really fine tuning the premotor cortex. Broca's area is specific to muscles used in speech. We can also say word formation. And that's Broca's area. So still a motor mo kind of going out to your body, but very, very specific to word, to um, muscles within your larynx, changing pitch of your vocal cords, your mouth, your tongue. So it's very, very specific to that. And then the frontal eye field is just muscles controlling your eyeballs. Where are we looking? Up, down, and around. And that's sort of coming from there. So that primary, let me go back here. This primary motor cortex here, this is another view of that. We can see the primary motor cortex. This is a superior, we're looking down at the top of the brain. And so we can see it going off to the right and left. If you were to cut down the middle, what we're seeing if we see the top of the brain here and the bottom of the brain here, um, you can see that different areas of this is targeted. All, this whole diagram is telling us exactly what part of the body would be stimulated or what, where the nerves originate. So if you were to stimulate it here, you're actually be stimulating the hand to move. If you were to maybe stimulate along this part, it might be over here and you might have some sort of face twitch, the muscles twitching in your face. So it's a very, very precise body map of how different areas of our body that's under motor control, that's the muscles. This is um, the guy here on the right, the motor guy. This is what our brain thinks that we look like based on the amount of space that we provide in here towards certain body parts. So we have a lot of control, fine control with our facial expressions as well as moving our hands. Um, and so this really is about number of motor units that we can recruit. Obviously our quadriceps and our legs are really, really powerful and strong. And so we see that over in this portion, but it really isn't a huge amount of our brain space involved in it because they're just moving our limbs. So it really means, you know, we don't have as much fine control over what's going on in our legs as we do on our face or our hands. So the sensory areas of the cerebral cortex, you should know that the parietal lobes, we've already talked about, that's where the sensory information is coming back up. The temporal lobes on the side, that's where our hearing is, as well as smell. And on the way back of our head, the occipital lobe, that's where we have vision. So in our somatosensory, somato means more um, of our surface touching, not so not our organs, not inside, more of our, you know, of our skin. That is going to be going to a primary somatosensory cortex, oops, which is this guy. So again, with the body map, we have a very precise body map. Each region is identifies with a different part of the body. Um, and then this brings in information about temperature, pressure, touch, just basic raw information. So when an area is known as primary, it's really that raw information. It is this somatosensory association area. And when it's something's referenced as this association, it means you are processing it and interpreting that. So if you get a bunch of stimuli from your hands into that primary somatosensory cortex, for instance, an example that I use is like if you stick your hand in your pocket and you have a bunch of change and stuff in there, you can feel around. You can go, oh, that's a quarter. That's a nickel. That's a penny. Oh, I have a button loose in there. Oh, that's lint. That's a piece of rock. You know, I got a toothpick in there, whatever it's in there. You're feeling it 
you're not seeing it with your eyes. So you're going by feel and it is your somatosensory association area that's telling you that's a toothpick and that's a coin. You know, it's actually interpreting that. So it's your life experiences that have told you this information. This guy here is what our body thinks that we look like based on the amount of space that our brain gives to um, the sensory input from there. The tongue, I have it circled just because I named all of the senses and I didn't mention the gustatory sense, which is our tongue and our taste. It's actually located along this um, somatosensory cortex. So this is what our body would look like, not including our genital genitalia um, of what we, our brain thinks that we look like based on the amount of space that it allots for each region. So referred pain is something I think we'll talk about tomorrow as well, but just really minimally. Um, referred pain is something that because we don't have a precise body map in our brain of our organs, when we have a organ that's having difficulty, say like lack of oxygen to a specific part of the heart, then that's really what a heart attack is. Because we don't have pain sensors that identifies our heart into our brain, it falls along dermatomes. So if you remember the picture of a guy, the dermatomes where have little stripes coming off with C1, C2, C3, and that you can actually do a pinprick on any given part and it, it provides a sensory map of exactly which spinal nerve comes off. So because of where the heart's positioned, any pain from the heart is actually coming back following some of those dermatomes that actually come from your left arm. So that's why people see, feel like they have a sharp pain radiating down their arm when they're having a heart attack. They obviously are not having pain in the arm, but it's referred pain coming along that same pathway. And because we have that brain map, our brain associates it with that region. So the temporal lobe is involved in hearing and smell. So we'll talk about the hearing portion first. This primary auditory cortex, that's sort of in this region here. So I have it circled big so you can see it, but this really just this part here. That is the area that receives information from your inner ear about pitch as well as uh, um, amplitude volume. So whether the pitch is high or low or volume is loud or soft, um, that basic raw information is coming to that region. And then it is this auditory association area that could be limited to this or it could enlarge. These aud auditory and later we're going to talk about the visual. It can be, some people have a much keener sense of hearing than another's and they may have a larger auditory association area. And that's where you're bringing in this information into the primary auditory cortex and then interpreting it. You might say, oh, I hear these high pitched noise. Is it Minnie Mouse talking or is it a bird whistling? And then again, that's your life experiences that you're able to interpret this. So again, with the association area being more the interpretation of the primary. Another sense is, for example, if you're a composer like Beethoven, Beethoven, for example, could listen to an entire orchestra play and could identify a specific person if their instrument was out of tune. I mean, he had such amazing hearing discernment that he could piece out some of these things where most normal people would just listen to the whole thing and think it sounds just fine or it sounds like a giant cacophony, who knows, but he could pull out these individual sounds. So he had a phenomenally developed auditory association area. In fact, people that are blind, we're going to learn later that vision is in the back, but if they're blind, they're not getting that stimulus and actually their sense of hearing is um, significantly improved. That's because the auditory association area will actually take up some of the regions within the visual field if it's not being utilized. Okay. This Wernicke's area here, actually, let me just outline it actually on here, this is Wernicke's area. That is also associated with hearing, but this is understanding words. So by it understanding the words we speak, 
if you recall, we already mentioned Broca's area. Broca's area is to form words or speech. It's the muscles used for speech. So Broca's, and this is only on the left side, is going to make the words go out. Whether you say, you know, I'm so happy school is out or school is canceled. The words, I'm happy school is canceled, is being formed by Broca's. Your Wernicke's is understanding the words that I'm saying. So as you learn different languages, you expand your Wernicke's area. And after a while, our brain is really gets pretty hardwired. This whole area back here in the brain, this is an area within the brain that's very, very, sorry, I shouldn't go sorry, very adaptable. It can actually be used more for Wernicke's, maybe more for auditory or more visual. So it's, a pre, it's not as hardwired, but once you get past childhood, things get are pretty hardwired from that point. But the otherwise, you have a greater capacity to learn languages and things and develop hearing for music while you're young. Just want to go back here. So we talked about Broca's where you're forming the words and we talked about Wernicke's where you're understanding words. This is only on the left side. Now, if we talk about the right side, the right side for Broca's, so we'll say right side of Broca's, it's known as the effective language area for Broca's, is the emotion into speech. So if I said school is canceled, the word school is canceled are coming from Broca's. My right side is putting a sad emotion in. Or I could say the same thing, school is canceled. That's a totally different interpretation that you may have. And that's again, the right side putting in either the sad tone or the happy tone. Now the right side for Wernicke's is you understanding that. Your straight up Wernicke's on the left side, it just says, school is out. But your right side Wernicke's heard it two ways. It would have heard me say it with sadness or it would have heard me say it with excitement. And that is the effective language area for Wernicke that's understanding the emotion associated with the words. And sometimes the emotion put into the words negates what the word is saying. Someone could say, I'm having a really great day. You know, then you know, okay, I'm hearing your words, but my effective language area maybe tells me that you don't mean that. So again, those are an example of two different sides. And so I definitely have some test questions about this, whether it's word formation or putting emotion into what we're saying or understanding the emotion in somebody else's words or just understanding only the words. If we were to pull back that temporal lobe a little bit, tucked inside is the olfactory cortex, and that's our sense of smell. On the back side of the brain, I've already mentioned it briefly, but the primary visual cortex right here is brings in information from our eyeballs. So our eyeballs come in and comes through here and brings our information back into this primary visual cortex. We'll talk more about this when we do the senses um, in the next chapter. And it brings information about light, colors, intensity, and then again with the association area. This is interpreting it. Are you looking at, you know, I've got a red folder here, or is it, um, is it a red book? Is it a red picture? Is it, it's through my life experience that I happen to know it's a folder? Or are you looking at a kind of a red blob? Is it a rose or is it a ball? Is it, so your, your life experiences are letting you associate this information that came in. The last thing is back to the frontal lobe is this prefrontal cortex. This whole area kind of right behind your forehead is all about who you are, your personality. Are you organized? Or are you disorganized? Can you plan ahead? Are you a good goal seeker? Do you set goals? Do you progress towards them? Or you just don't care? You're just fine. You just take things as they are. All of those things are about who you are is happening in that prefrontal cortex. And much of that is actually learned and developed. So you can imagine, you know, little kids, you look at a three or four year old, they have very little impulse control. So they need to learn that they need, you know, instead of just grabbing another kid's toys, they can be guided. Did you want to play with that truck? 
Yes, I do. Well, looks like Susie's not done playing with it. Can you wait till she's done? Sure, okay. All of a sudden, that's the first acknowledgement that maybe there's another human in the world that needs stuff. So this sort of training and development is occurring and that's helping to adapt your prefrontal cortex. The, this is a slide here that tells me to tell you about the start of neurology. The start of neurology happened from a gentleman named Phineas Gage, who was a supervisor um, for building the railroad, and I don't recall the year, but he was well known as being a highly respected person, very organized. He was had a lot of these personality characteristics that you know made him successful to work with people and to organize people and to be a supervisor. There was an explosion. Phineas gets knocked over. People go to pick him up, bring him into the doctor, and they notice he has an abrasion by the side of his head. And they think, you know, it's like flying rocks, flying debris, must have hit his head. The doctor then later noticed that it was actually a hole and another hole that came out. And it actually was a two foot metal rod that shot through, it came under his cheekbone and came out the top of his head and it angled through the brain here. And so this is actually a picture of Phineas. His eye, I believe, was taken out because I think it went behind the eye socket, but I think it ruined his old um, optic nerve, I think. Um, and then it came out. This is actually a, a picture of his skull. And these are the computer-generated um, trajectories of this projectile that came through. And he was alive. He came, you know, he recovered. Even at the time, he was breathing fine. It didn't affect his breathing. He could move his limbs. So it was the first time that it was figured out that, hey, your brain, that's not just this big blob, each part actually does something different. And so this was the first time that we realized the front part, he is still functioning as a human, but the only change that happened is when he was a totally different person. Spacey, he was like hung out with animals and communicated with the animals, had no sense of time, was not punctual at all. I don't know, just characteristics that were completely opposite of who he was. Um, even some ch um, juvenile childlike behavior. And so that was, um, again, he's really the start of the science of neurology. This slide here is just all of the features that you should know. So I would recommend getting a blank one of these, making, you know, several of these, putting these on flashcards. What is the prefrontal cortex? Or maybe putting letters in each of these regions and testing yourself. Or load this up onto Quizlet to make yourself your own Quizlet. So you should know the names, you should be able to label this, but you should also know what each of these regions do. The last thing we're going to talk about here are electroencephalogram waves, also known as EEGs. So that's the electroencephalogram is the EEG. We have alpha, beta, theta, and delta. Normal people that are just functioning, awake, um, alert, kind of stressed, like hyper-focused, that you're going to be predominantly driven by beta waves. So the beta waves are just a certain frequency that's actually traveling through your brain. So you, um, this is picked up by actually putting electrodes on the surface of the brain and measuring what's going on and looking at the frequency. So that's why it's measured in hertz. It's a frequency, um, meaning number times per second impulses are going. And so you're getting beta waves that's with these normal, associated with normal alert people. If someone's just chilling out, kicking back on the sofa, mellow, just letting no stress, really calm, that's going to be alpha waves. Then delta is really, you know, predominant during sleep. So I want you to really think about sleep and delta. And then you can see here that actually if you have too many delta waves when you're in an awake adult, if you're awake, you should be alpha or beta. But if you're awake and adult and it's like, hello, now everybody's home, that would be a delta wave. because that's a, So you can kind of identify various brain problems based on these EEGs. The theta waves also are often found in children, um, but obviously in adults that have is other various issues, brain disorders or frustration or kind of thing. So what I'd like you to just take away from here is sharp focus. Maybe while you're taking your test, you want your beta waves to be predominant. 
kind of kick back, you know, relaxing at home, alpha waves will be predominant. And you're having a really nice deep sleep, think of delta waves. So the do you know, the regions of the brain, you have your cerebrum, and that's what we talked about today. Then what we'll talk about in the next lecture is inside the diencephalon and then the brain stem and the cerebellum. So those are the regions of the brain. Gray and white matter, gray matter is where the synapse is taking place. So you have a, a nerve cell body dendrites um, that's, and you have an axon terminal from another nerve. So that's where that connection is taking place. The white matter is just the wires themselves. The divisions of the cerebrum are really the lobes, the frontal, the parietal, the temporal, and the occipital. Then the motor areas and higher order thinking areas, the frontal lobe. So we know the motor areas are the pre-motor cortex, that's planning out the sequence of events um, that you're gonna need of muscles, not sequence, the sequence of muscles needed for a certain movement. Like we're gonna throw a baseball. Um, the premotor cortex is going to tell you, you need to grip the ball, what muscles need to happen there. Then once you grip the ball, you need to time it that where you're going to lift the hand up and draw the shoulder back. And so it's the premotor cortex is planning it out and then it's telling the primary motor cortex to then execute that. So when you're practicing throwing the ball or say, I don't know, my son plays hockey. So I took him to the rink the other day and he's practicing shooting at the goal. So several of his shots were wide and high. Well, his pre-motor cortex has to realize, uh-oh, I recruited too much muscle, I had too much lift. So when you're practicing, you're refining your pre-motor cortex so it can then tell the primary how much or how little muscle pull needs to happen. So um, then you broke his area for words for speech. And, and we have then the area for moving the eyeballs around. The higher order thinking is that prefrontal cortex. The somatosensory areas of parietal lobe, you should know specifically the primary somatosensory cortex, that's the sensory information coming there. Then right behind it is the somatosensory association area where you interpret those sensations. The temporal lobe, we know it's hearing, Primary auditory gives us pitch and volume where that auditory association tells us that we're interpreting those sounds, whether it's a high pitched voice or was it breaking of a, a, um, brakes squeaking. Then we also have the Wernicke's area. Sorry, that's it. not quite in the temporal lobe, but crosses over. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment. Visual, you have your primary visual cortex that gives you information on light, color, darkness, the visual association area, interprets that. Then the language integrative areas, that means the right side. Right side brokas is you're putting emotion into speech. Right side Wernicke's is your understanding someone's emotion in speech. And the EEG waves, you should know that alpha is for somebody that's really mellow, relaxed, beta is focused, and delta is going to be somebody that's sleeping. Those would be the main associations you'd want for that. And that's it. Hope you, if you have any questions, let me know.